setting because I just moved. So things are not quite as set up right now. I will have a better setup in the future. So just so you know. But for now, let's just get into the case. So tonight we are going to talk about the suspicious death of Anna Mendiana. I'm sorry if I pronounced her name wrong. I think it's Anna. Um, so she was five feet tall, but her personality and power as a person and an artist made her seem taller. She died at a young, the young age of 35. She was born November 18th, 1948 in Havana, Havana, Cuba, sorry, to Ignacio and Raquel Mendieta. So again, I apologize if I'm saying the names wrong. I'm not great at pronouncing things. Though she came to live in the United States due to Operation Peter Pan, which was active during the Cuban Revolution, she was sent to America at 15 years old, which according to the documentary that I watched, they thought would only be for like a year, but ended up being separated for much longer. Um... So, she and her sister, Raquelene, sorry, I'm not good at pronouncing names. Um, she and her sister went to the U.S. in 1961, and according to her sister, when they arrived in Miami, Anna kissed the ground, though these good feelings did not last for her. The girls ended up at some point in an Iowa reform school with meetings and confinement as consequences for even the smallest of offenses. The sisters did end up being split up at one point as well and placed in different foster homes. So the feelings of abandonment and isolation came from these experiences, sprung from these experiences. She did eventually get to see her mom and brother in 1966, though she was unable to see her father until 1979. It is also noted, according to sources, that Anna's father joined the Bay Vegas Counter Revolutionary Party and was imprisoned for 18 years as a result. Her father died shortly after making it to the United States. Um, so, Cuban immigrant children were essentially seen as delinquents. They couldn't be trusted to watch the TV by themselves in a room. This is according to Anna's sister. Patria pro protested is the name of the campaign associated with Operation Peter Pan, which was initiated by the U.S. State Department and Catholic Church and overseen by Monsignor Walsh, who strove to evoke discontentment discontent and discredit the Cuban Revolution, like they as a whole strove to do that, strove to evoke discontent. Um, from 60 to 62, more than 40,000 children, Cuban children, came to the U.S. with 8,000 without their parents, family, or their relatives, and this led to their placement in foster care and orphanages. Some say was to some extent, based on their religion. Um, I guess it means the Catholic Church involved. So, Operation Peter Pan began end of December 1960, the 26th, and went on until till 62. Peter Pan was government-sanctioned by Eisenhower administration during the Cold War, and it waived visa requirements. Um, and much of the reasoning behind implementing Peter Operation Peter Pan was based on the American fight against communism as an ideology. The program was very hush-hush, and the government was trying to keep it out of the news. Um, some parents put their children on a plane to America and would never see them again. And a lot of this reminded me of children during COVID. Um, children separated thanks to um, and the maltreatment for one thing, um, which is this idea of being like split up from your parents and not seen as a priority. It's just awful. It really rips at your heartstrings. 
so of those children who were part of the Operation 60% became the U.S. government's responsibility. It was not expected that families might be separated for so long. Excuse me. Children would begin in temporary camps before going to foster homes and other locations and facilities. Some of these children found themselves from home to home. Some were abused in cases even enduring forced labor. In one example that I read, there were two siblings that were forgotten by their social worker who was supposed to connect them with their uncle, but instead they were treated as delinquents and provided subpar care. Displacement and children lost in the system was not applying only to those less fortunate within Operation Peter Pan. Even those children from families of privilege got lost in the shuffle. It really didn't matter. You were an immigrant, regardless. Um, unfortunately, it resulted in a lot of emotional and psychological trauma, and these types of separations still do, obviously. Many children with family in the U.S. ending up lost in the system. This is referred to as exile. Ending up in homes for trouble to use foster care or orphanages. So, Anna's family was very opposed to communism. Her mother, in the documentary, talks about her husband, Anna's father, Ignacio Alberto Mendieta, how he worked in opposition of Batista. When Castro came into power at that time, he was a lawyer for the Cuban State Department. After Castro declared himself a communist, he resigned from his position. They didn't want their children living in a communist nation, and they were worried about their safety. They didn't want their kids to wind up in a work camp, which was a very real fear. So, um, Anna, like I said, I can't remember if I mentioned this or not, but she was born on November 18th, 1948. I don't think I did. Yes, so November 18th, 1948, and she died September 9th, 1985. Anna was the second of three children, described as feisty and combative. Um, so I forgot to do this earlier, but I wanted to pause now and just take a moment and just think of Anna and, you know, her loss in the world, the beauty that she brought to it, and acknowledge the real heartache in this loss. And though I may sound very non-emotional when I describe cases, it is emotional and, you know, lives matter. You know, that's why I'm covering the case. So let's just take a moment and honor her as best we can. I will do my best to be mindful in my coverage. Okay, so let's talk more about her. So Anna Mendieta, I'm sorry, I hope that's how you say it. Um, she's a, she was a famous artist. She attended the University of Iowa, obtaining her MFA, and where she was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship. I believe. Later moving to Nor New York City, she was a sculptor, an earth artist, or also referred to as land art. Um, the movement particularly popular during the 60s and 70s. A Cuban-American artist whose work was expressive and provocative by using her body in combination with nature as her sculpture's medium to create work with which evoked passion, feminist ideals, and reflected her feelings of displacement, those associated with her childhood experiences. Her work was highly controversial, again, reflecting her strong roots in feminism. Uh, she is considered a pioneer of earth art, creating many of these works in Iowa and Mexico, and some in Cuba, uh, using the natural landscape. Again, re uh, referred to as earth body, according to her. She uses earth as a canvas and the soul as an instrument focus on mother nature in the human form, looking at the connection between primordial body and nature. There was very restlessness in her art. I will try to be sure to include images of her art. It's very powerful. I was like, I want to be when I grew up. When I looked into her, I was like, can I please 
always be you. You're amazing. And, you know, it's particularly sad that somebody with such vitality was taken so early in her life. It's just, it's a real shame. So I'm very excited to talk about her. So she created, for one thing, she created silhouettes of her body in mud, earth, and rocks, wildflowers, and leaves. Uh, performance pieces that evoked the folk and cult traditions of her native Cuba, as well as her beloved Mexico, and submersive self-portraits that played with notions of beauty, belonging, and gender in some of her performance pieces. In some cases, she used blood as something, a tool, something magic. Again, evoking this sense of the female sexuality of male sexual violence in some of her work, which is really powerful. Um, so, she also has some photographic self-portraits where she, like, presses her face really close to the glass to make her image distorted, to change her features in a way. Things like that. Uh, she glues on male facial hair in one instance. Some instances. So here's another quote from Anna Mendieta. I am overwhelmed by the feeling of having been cast from the womb in nature. My art is the way I reestablish the bonds that unite me to the universe. So she had her first solo show in 71, which is cool. Um, and that same year, she traveled to Mexico for research. That was one of her did some of her work. Um, so she conducted her silhouette series that is one of the most well-known works of hers that went from 73 to 80. Um, in 1981, an artist statement and it is quoted as on it is quoted as saying, in reference to silhouette, I've been carrying out a dialogue between the landscape and the female body based on my own silhouettes where it comes in on the feminine, with Mother Earth being a female force. Her art comments on human equality in phases of life and death that humans experience. Her Earth art body pieces emphasize complexities of life for women, especially immigrants or those that fall outside the cultural norm. Um, she's also remembered for, you know, the performance art, body art. And again, they, many of her work touches on oppression, an impression of women, some of which, you know, was during the 70s and things like that. Yeah, so she really touches on some things that it takes a lot of courage to, to you know, bring up publicly. I mean, everyone sees it, you know what I mean? Like, that takes a lot of courage, a lot of balls. Um, so, themes and messages, personal experience. For her, like uh, the trauma being ripped from her home in Cuba as a child, and then returning to her to Mother Earth, that's her womb. Uh, and with this idea of the physical body being a place for both identity and censure, I just find that to be fascinating. Uh, this idea of displacement I've seen a lot in um, the poetic works of Ruby Kaur. I don't know how to say your name. So, if this resonates with you, I would highly recommend checking out her work. Um, her first two books, uh, so, Milk and Honey and The Sun and Her Flowers, my favorite piece that talks about the body as like a home. There's a poem in The Sun and Her Flowers that kind of touches on it. There's one in particular I'm thinking of, but... Anyways, so in 1973, she actually um, had this performance art that she, the series that she conducted, which was motivated based on the rape and murder of a student at her university named Sarah Ann Auden. And yeah, so she used blood in some of her performance art, such as body tracks. Um, let's see, here, 
here's another quote from the author, Anna Mendieta. My art is grounded on the belief in one universal energy which runs through everything. From insect to man, from man to specter, from specter to plant, from plant to galaxy. So I will also note that Andre, her husband, was also a famous artist, some say more famous than her, but we're going to focus more on Anna because she's the victim here, and honestly, she seems a lot more interesting to me. But that's just because I'm biased. Okay, so he was known throughout Europe and the United States. He was a leading artist in the minimalist sculptor, the sculpture movement. Some work he's known for include an untitled sculptor, modern in his work called Stonefield Sculpture, which consists of 36 uncut boulders. So, uh, Mendieta moved to New York in 78. Andre and Mendieta met, met in 79, when um, Anna was sort of an up-and-coming artist, newer to the scene, while Andre was more well-known. Their relationship is regarded as having been very tempestuous, stormy. Andre today should be like 87, 88 years old, I believe. Um, the couple met through her friend, Nancy Sparrow. Many saw Anna as feisty and opinionated while viewing Andre as cold and detached. So his name is Carl Andre. Um, he's seen as sort of like aloof. So this kind of relationship of opposites attract friends up remarked that the couple did get into some heavy drinking as well, many commenting that, while intoxicated, Anna would readily start some fights. So Carl Andre, many say he was protected by those who backed him, have profited from their association with him, and that he is still today viewed by many as a genius. Peter Sheldahl, sorry, an art critic, describes him as a prima donna and a bully. Art world is one, they say, that's hinged on discretion. And so Andre was bailed out of Rikers by Lawrence Weiner, Weiner, who says he never asked about what occurred and is quoted as saying, I don't intrude on my friends. But wouldn't you want to know if you're bailing someone out whether they did it or what it is that they are being accused of? This friend Ruby Rich shared with Molesworth, an art historian who as a podcast, Death of an Artist, I believe. Um, so, Ruby Rich shared with Molesworth that an assistant DA said to them, they never encountered a wall of silence like this one, except in mafia cases. So, referring to um, this case, it's very interesting that things would be so hush-hush, you know, so... Um, she died September 9th, 1985. So, her husband, Carl Andre, then 49, was arrested several hours following her death. Carl believed to have pushed her out the window of their building amid an argument. Their apartment was located on Mercer Street in Manhattan. The couple was heard arguing, according to neighbors, at about 5.30 a.m. From what I've read in sources, but different sources say different things, just... They had been married eight months prior to Anna's death. Anna's descent was 34 stories before she landed atop their local deli. Somewhere like 33 stories landed atop their local deli on the second story. I also wanted to note that Anna was very afraid of heights and would not have jumped or fallen out of a window. Both Andre and Mendieta were said to have been intoxicated at the time of her death or accident, if that's what you want to go with. However, you want to characterize it. Carl was said to have claimed to not remember what happened, according to some sources. Um, so, Mendieta's friend, Ted Victoria, um, said that this put to the notion that she would jump out of the window in her underwear. No, she had too much going for her at the time, more so than him before her death. She was up. No, sorry, more than him. Her work was being noticed. She wasn't depressed. I know because I saw her a few nights before her death. She was up and happy. She hated heights. 
so she would not have climbed up on the window, which was close to and just above the bed in their apartment. My guess is they were fighting and it just happened. This terrible thing. So then um, Dottie Addie, a friend of Mendieta, uh, she said most people thought he had done something active. Others who knew him could not believe it. Most of his women friends supported him, but people wanted to blame somebody. There was a lot of division in the New York art world over her death. People took sides. Screams were heard that neighbors, passers-by, characterized as consistent with someone being thrown out the window. Additionally, Andre had scratches on his face, nose, and arms, and there were indications of a struggle at the residence. While Carl does admit they had been fighting or arguing, he claims, Anna went into their bedroom and afterwards he could not locate her. Andre was arrested hours after her death or being let out on bail for $250,000. Andre tried to use his artwork as bail also, which the judge did not allow. The judge also forced him to surrender his passport, of course. A famous artist would definitely be a flight risk. It, um, I believe he also had a home in Paris, if I'm not mistaken. So, like, he had another home somewhere else he could have rushed off to. It was noted that no footprints were found on the windowsill where she allegedly fell. According to one of Anna's friends, Marcia Pels, the night before she died, she expressed she was planning to leave him that day. She had collected evidence showing his infidelity based on phone records and credit card details. Things which detectives either did not obtain or did not include in his trial. That's weird. So, with the 911 call, where Carl told the operator she killed herself, committed suicide, which he later claims her death is an accident. Um, a doorman in their building recalls hearing a woman scream, no, 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 prior to Anna's fall. Fall, wherein the doorman heard a thud indicating her body hit the roof of the deli. So yeah, there's discrepancies in the 911 call and statements made by Carl. You've got this doorman and what he claims he heard. You have passers-by and their statements. Um, so Carl and his lawyers during trial utilized Anna's work, her works of art, as their ev evidence or indications of potential for argument suicide for the sake of art based on her interest or preoccupation with blood, her interest in body um, and its impact on the earth, and her captivation with themes of violence, her knowledge of rituals and religions, um, of Afro-Caribbean descent. And then Carl's lawyers suggest a, tri a trial day performance of sacrifice, performance of sacrifice, whatever that supposed to be. That is a um, direct quote from the Death of an Artist podcast. In 1973, Anna conducted artwork where she staged the aftermath of rape and murder as one of her fellow students had this happened to them. She also filmed reactions to staged blood coming out of her apartment. This work is called Moffat Building Peace. So there's also evidence was dismissed discredited at his bench trial. Once the trial came to a close, Andre spoke with his gallery, which opted to ne never speak about it again, like they directly said that. Carl chose a ju trial by judge instead of a jury, which many did not have to stand withstand cross-examination by a prosecutor, and many consider this choice indicative of potential guilt. Though indicted on numerous occasions, Carl was acquitted based off insufficient evidence to show he, in a drunken stupor, shoved her out the window to her death. Many friends on us still maintain he is responsible. Unfortunately, without any witness to the events, it's hard to prove with certainty that he is responsible for her death. Nobody, like, saw it, you know. Case. Our case brings home the tragic truth of so many victims whose deaths are a result of IPV, interpersonal violence, with 
percent of women killed in the U.S. murdered by their intimate partner. And a high number of these killed without an eyewitness. Um, according to Ruby Rich, there were too many things that were just not right about the trial. Not least the cynical way in which his lawyers tried to use her art to back up the suggestion that she committed suicide. Many powerful figures in the art, art world colluded in that. Despite being arrested, tried, and then acquitted, Andre still lives in the same building that Lana fell from. If your girlfriend fell from your building, could you still live there years later? Just something to ask yourself. I find it very, 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 very strange. Just me personally. It's okay if you don't. He continues to be successful as an artist. If you are interested, I highly suggest checking out the podcast that of an artist or the documentary on Amendiana, Puedo de Tierra, 1987, from the vaults. So Anna was connected to the feminist art community and was part of the young progressive Cuban community of New York and Chicago. Her mother in Iowa, her cousin lives in Havana, and she did, and her uh, cousin teaches on Cuban culture at Instituto Superior de Arte. Her sister is Raquel Mendieta Harrington. Um, Anna's artwork today is valued for its applicability when considering the earth, so environmental concerns, movements of human populations, and sentiments of impermanence and concepts of the body. Her work has been um, inspirational for activists of younger generations. Part of the thrill and the attraction in the philosophical and emotional boulevard is that it transcends time every once in a while. What do you do when this thing that transcends time is made by someone who is a mere mortal? According to Molesworth, the art and the people are different, and I think that in the West we do not yet understand how to have these those conversations or make them more ethically productive. Despite the powerful ways in which Mendiana challenged dominant art narratives, her work is most of the time sadly canonized by her death, which turned her into a symbol for unveiling the art world's dark and elit elitist sexism. I don't want it to get in the way of the work. Her sister, Raglan Mendieta, once said, her death has really nothing to do with her work. Her work was about life and power and energy and not about death. And that really resonated with me, so I, I thought it'd be apt to include that at the end of this video. I hope you got something out of this case. I know a lot of this is more about art than murder, but it's a real shame that such a beautiful human was murdered, and I wanted to talk about her. So, I hope you still found it interesting nonetheless. I mean, I will also say one other thing. In the article that I found first, I actually found it from a, a I went to a, a Zoom event about Earth Arts, and the, um, the lecturer mentioned the name of this article, and in the article's title, it says that the sculptor's wife, and so they don't even describe her as a sculptor, and sculptor herself in the article. And I was just amazed by the fact that I'd never heard of this person, Anna Mendieta, and I'd never heard about her death. You know, because like, it seems like a big deal to me that this artist was murdered by her husband in the 80s. I don't know. I thought it was very interesting. Um, I will be sure to include photos of her and her art in the video. So um, anyways, without further ado, that is the end. So thank you. Thank you so much for watching. I look forward to seeing you in my next one. Sweet dreams, monies. Like and subscribe.